Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're going to open up Sabbath school with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath morning. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word with fellow believers. Lord, we ask that you would bless us with wisdom, with knowledge, and with understanding of your word, that this lesson will be applied in our hearts and a reflection of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this week's lesson is Law and Grace. The lesson examines the interrelationship of law and grace for believers, you and I. The book of Deuteronomy connects grace and law together. In Deuteronomy, law is understood as covenant. A covenant, a biblical covenant, consists of conditional promises to humanity by God. God promises to protect and bless his people if the people keep his law. Our lo lesson points to law and grace from the divine and human perspectives. The memory verse is from Galatians 2, 21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Themes from this lesson will include 
grace that proceeds and leads to the law, the graciousness of the law, and of course, law and grace. Sunday's lesson is called Law in Heaven. God is love. God wants our love. As a lesson in case God created us as moral creatures with moral freedom, the freedom inherent in love. With moral freedom, we have moral law, even in heaven. No, especially in heaven. God has a moral law for the angels. Can someone read Ezekiel 28, 15 to 16? Ezekiel 28, verses 15 and 16. Thank you. Ezekiel 28, 15 to and 16. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness were found in you. And the abundance of, of your tree you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sin, and you sin. So I cast you into a profound thing from the mountain of God, and I destroy you, O guardian cherubim from the midst of the stone of fire. Do you see how the knowledge of God's moral law was present in heaven? Everyone is agreed in that? We're going to look at Romans 7.7. 7. Can someone read that? Romans 7, verse 7. Romans, Romans 7, 7? Yes. Okay, so Romans 7, 7. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of sinful, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. Thank you. Do you think the angels in heaven are still vulnerable to sin? Why? Do you want to use the mic? They, so the audience at home can hear? Yes, I believe the angels are, which they vulnerable to sin. Yeah, because they were perfect back then, even when Lucifer was still in heaven, and and they're still perfect now, perfect in the way that God made them. So they took a stance. Those a third of the angels followed Lucifer and and fell, but two thirds took a stand and believed in. God the Father. So they had faith uh, and trust in God the Creator. And I feel like they still do now. And uh, they're like us. They have, well, apparently they had a choice even back then because they chose to, those that chose to follow Satan did. And we as humans have a choice to follow God or follow Satan. So um, it's in their power. So yeah, they're still vulnerable but they have to make that decision to stand firm. What, what, was, the, what was the question? Are angels in heaven still vulnerable to sin? Are the angels in heaven still vulnerable to sin? So <laughs> before I go to the still part, <laughs> I, I have a little difficulty with the premise of the question and the premise of Sunday's lesson which is that, that God have laws in heaven before sin that said, thou shall not sin or thou shall not covet your, your fellow angels, toothbrush or whatever it is. I don't think that existed. 
And that, they, that is why they're saying it's a mystery how sin was found in him. Because I don't think, I don't, I don't think there was a need for a moral law in heaven, as if there were some immoral beings in heaven. The, the, the beings in heaven were perfect. Uh, and I think sin, the way sin found its way in heaven and in Lucifer's heart is a mystery. And to say that there is some moral law in heaven, to me, is suggesting that I, I don't know. It, it, I have a little difficulty thinking that God has a thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's stuff in, in heaven, even before Satan was there. So, but the other part of that is that Satan did sin. So how did he know? How did anyone know that what Satan did was wrong? So there had to be some standard in heaven that they could not trespass, that they could not violate in order for him to be determined to as having iniquity in him and being a sinner. So the, the law, the moral law, is really a reflection of God's character. It's a reflection of his standards of what we should and shouldn't do. That, that's my thought. Does anyone else have a thought on that? I'm sorry, Hans. Thank you. Okay. Is moral law inseparable for moral beings? Is moral law inseparable from moral beings? In other words, do you have to have a law and, I mean, a moral law to be a moral being? Do they connect? Can you hear the microphone? I don't think they're inseparable because if they were, then we wouldn't need them. Thank you. Gavin Kevin has something to share. Hey, sorry. So I, this one again is, I'm just sharing my feeling on this one. But um, yes, I think moral law are for moral things. So like the plants, I don't think there's a moral law for a plant. I don't know, I've never been a plant. But I'm, just, I'm just thinking that moral laws are for moral, are for people with morals. So uh, rocks wouldn't, there shouldn't be a moral law for rocks either. Uh, so I'm thinking, it's in that context, I'm thinking that it is people who can think and conceive and of right and wrong or stuff like that. Whatever you consider morals as, it would be beings that can think and decipher between right and wrong. Thank you. Amen. That's what I believe because, I mean, you know, why would... Why would Tanya is going to share something. I, uh, that's what I believe, Kevin, because why would a tree, why is it so loud? Why would a tree or a stone need something to govern them when they can't move or talk or act or make decision? That would be null and void. So the moral law has to be for moral beings, people who can understand what the law is all about. Avine, you have something you want to share? No, I. I was just thinking that God made mankind uh, moral beings. He made us intelligent, able to decide and choose for, you know, make decisions. Thank you. Does anyone else have a comment before we move on to Monday's lesson? Okay, Monday's lesson is entitled Law and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is Moses' final instructions to the Israelites before they enter the Promised Land. Moses gave the people the commands they were to obey. We're going to read a few verses from the book of Deuteronomy. And if someone can read Deuteronomy 17, verse 19, I need someone to read Deuteronomy 30, verse 9 and 10, and Deuteronomy 32, verse 46. So Deuteronomy 17, 19, Deuteronomy 30, verses 9 and 10, and Deuteronomy 32, 46. Deuteronomy um, 17. 17, verse 19. And it shall be with you, and it shall be with him, 
and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Thank you. And can someone read Deuteronomy 30 verses 9 and 10? Deuteronomy 30, 9 and 10 says, The Lord your God will then make you successful in everything you do. He will give you many children and numerous livestock, and he will cause your fields to produce abundant harvest. For the Lord will again delight in being good to you as he was to your ancestors. The Lord your God will delight in you if you obey his voice and keep the commands and decrees written in this book of instruction, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Thank you. And the last one is Deuteronomy 32, verse 46. And he said unto them, Set your hearts upon all the words which I testify among you this day, which he shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. Thank you. So what's the key theme of those messages in Deuteronomy, or those, or those verses? Keeping the law. And why is this essential for these Israelites? Why is it essential for the Israelites to keep God's commands, to love God with all their heart and soul? That's what builds the connection between them and God. Because St. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so it is imperative that they keep the law as a binding contract between them and God. Thank you. Even you have something you want to share? I think also it was for their own benefit in... Um, in keeping the commandments. Yes. I see when we are when we are disobedient or you know, go against God will how much we suffer. How much when we are influenced by when they were influenced by other nations, um, you know, what, what trouble they were in. So I think it's for on our benefit as well. God's trying to protect us from this even destroying our own selves. Yes. So is this message essential for us today? Yes. Exactly. Obedience is life. It's our light. It's our faith and trust in God's word. By obedience, we receive what? We receive grace, unmerited grace. Can someone read Romans 3.28? Romans 3, 28, it says, So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. So our response to our law is obedience. And what does obedience give us? Grace? Okay, so when bad things happen, while we're obeying God, do we still have that same grace? when bad things happen to us. If we're sick, or if we're experiencing a heartbreak, or lose a loved one, or lose a job, or going through any type of trial or error, do we still experience God's grace while we're obeying him and bad things are happening to us? Is God still with us? Thank you. Okay, of course, because we're, Thank you, Evine. Um, Matthew 28 says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we are never alone, no matter what happens. A lot of times when people experience heartache or hardship, especially someone who is, doesn't have a, a close relationship with God, they're going to say, well, God wasn't with me when I went through this, or God abandoned me and he didn't help me. How, how can we encourage others to see God 
especially when they're going through difficult times, when they're saying they don't believe God loves them when they were going through the loss of a loved one or they were ill or they were homeless or any type of hardship. How do we encourage others in those scenarios? Because I've, I've heard that lots of times. You know, young adults, like people that my children know, you know, they'll say, well, I don't really believe in God because God didn't help me and I lost this and I asked God to do this for me and he didn't do it. How do we respond to people that are in those scenarios? And I want someone else to, to share their inexperience. Please. Well, I guess um, it's it's really hard to um, when the person going through the hard time or the hardship, if you want to call it that way, to make them see. You will try to make them see, but it's at the time when it happened. There's they have to go through that grieving process. You you have to allow them to grieve, but you're still there to encourage them, but. Still, if they, um, you don't want to say, okay, if they curse God, like some of Job's friends said, but still allow them to go through that grieving process and let them know, of course, you're here for them. Um, God's still here, even though they won't be able to feel it right now. Because I was listening to um, someone saying this elder uh, from one of our church there was a, car, a bus accident, and the elder, um, they really, they were the really helpful in the church, and they have, they had only one child. And when the car accident happened, uh, uh, the lady with four kids, not, nothing happened to to the, um, her kids, and the one with just one, that's the one who died. And the elder left church, separate the husband and wife separate. I mean, it was just devastating. So in a time like this, um, you, you still stand firm, know, knowing God is there, and you reminding them as much as you can, but don't push them for them to see God right there because they will go through, let them go through the process, Thank and you. eventually they will come out of it. But you pray for them also yeah. that um, nothing else happened to them before they come out of it. So let them go through the grieving process. But pray for them. Um, continue sending the message and stuff. Let them know God is still there, but it's still let them go through the process. Thank you, DJ. That was a good example. It's really important that we listen to people and let them express how they feel their hurt and their anguish. Sometimes listening is just that first step to opening a door where Christ can enter because then you're going to be praying for that person and you're going to continue to encourage that person. So many Christians can see God during the storm. They can see the light. They know there's a rainbow after the storm, but those who don't have that relationship with Christ, they don't always see that. So we need to be gracious and loving and kind and patient with them just like God is towards us. And even for us also, we might think, oh, we're so strong until we're in the midst of the problem. That's when we know, oh, gosh, I thought I was stronger than that. So This is true. Okay. Okay, does grace from God save us apart from works of the law? Read Romans 3.20. Can someone read Romans 3.20? For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. And read John 14.15, what Jesus says. I didn't hear you. If you love me, keep my commands. So how does God see love? How do we show God love according to this verse? 
through obedience by keeping his commandments. The lesson points out God's grace, forgiveness. He forgives us for violating his law. God's grace enables us to obey his law. Obedience from our covenant relationship with him, the Messianic covenant. See Exodus 31, verse 13 to 17. Can someone read Exodus 31, verse 13 to 17? Thirty-one, thirteen, and seven. Oh, well, I don't, yeah. Go ahead and read those. It's only four verses. Exodus. Thirty-one, thirteen, to seventeen. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that he may know that I am the Lord that doeth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death, for whosoever doeth any work therein, that so shall be cut off from among his people. Six days my work be done, <coughs> but in the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Okay, and then I have one other verse. It's from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Okay, it's called a new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. So God has given us his laws are in our hearts, so we know right from wrong. He made this covenant with us, and our response to, to, to God's love and grace towards us is going to be obedience, and, we, and when we show grace and kindness towards others, it's a reflection of our love for God. It's a reflection of our commitment to God. It's a reflection of our faith and belief. Do you believe in organized religion that legalism can be a hindrance or deterrence to the law of God. Because a lot of individuals will say, I don't like organized religion because it's not really teaching us about God. Man made these rules and I don't want to be a part of that. Do you think there's too much legalism or that it keeps people from having a relationship with God? Well, I, I, think, I think if we learn from the Bible, one of the lessons that I learned from the Bible at least is that if you want to get good people to do the wrong thing, it's not... You're not as successful if you just bring something illegal or forbidden to them as if you bring something that is good and change it a little so that it's wrong. Right? So it's familiar, but it's wrong. And it's even better if, if when you make that change, it's a change that makes it easier for them to do what they knew is supposed to be done. You know, it's kind of like 
So I guess what I'm saying is, I think from the very beginning, there has always been people who has led good, God-believing people astray. And some of them are, and, and some of them have churches. You think of Koresh, you think of the guy, Jim Jones, or whatever it is. These weren't, these weren't people who didn't believe in Jesus. <laughs> these were people who believe in God, right? So in organized religion, I think you do... It's, it's something that is there to help help us, but it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't preclude us from being vigilant and watchful. We still need to be vigilant and watchful for the wolf in, in sheep clothing. Daddy, you have something you want to share? Can someone give the mic to, to Daddy? Well, this is to make sure the people at home can hear you. Because when we don't use that, it's... No, it's... No, they're not... They're just... (laughs) What I was going to say is I've heard people say what you're saying, you know. And the thing is they want to believe the interpretation of what they want it to be, not what the Bible really says. So they're going to twist the words around to fit them so they don't maybe feel guilty or whatever it's like. It's okay, it's okay, you know, I can do whatever. And a lot of the churches that are in that realm are your non-denominational churches because they allow the people to interpret any way they want to. They're not guiding them into the truth. Does anyone else have anything to share about legalism? Okay, we'll move on to, and thank you, Dottie. Okay, I guess we're on Wednesday's lesson, Latav Locke. Um, It says, some of us have heard, oh, you know, a lot of people say that God in the Old Testament is mean and Jesus in the New Testament is love and the, the book of Deuteronomy is teaching us just the opposite. That he is teaching us that God is love, and it does it through several, there are several verses that we can look at that point that out. I am going to look at Deuteronomy 10, verses 11 through 14, if someone wants to read that, otherwise I will. Deuteronomy 10, 11 through 14. All right, there we go. Deuteronomy 10, verse 11 through 14 says, Then the Lord said to me, Get up and resume the journey and lead the people to the land I swore to give to their ancestors so they may take possession of it. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's command and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Look, the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it belongs to the Lord your God. So the lesson is pointing out that the reason God gave us these commandments is for our own good. Do you agree? How has obedience to God been for your own good? Can someone give me an example? Where you obeyed God and it was a blessing for you. I I just know there are lots and lots of examples. Just one, please. Thy, thy shall not steal. <laughs> and sometimes we twist the, um, the things to make it fit our boxes, and we say we're not stealing. But So, yes, I stole. 
<laughs> so I went to a thrift store and I purchased two two lamp. <laughs> I purchased two lamp. But when I bought them to the cashier, I told her, okay, they were one price for the two. Of course, I thought I got away with it. I got in my car, I got home, and I pick up the one, and I clink it, and it broke into pieces. So, and I have one left. And um, I start laughing, and Joshua like, why are you laughing? I said, you won't believe, look at God. I pay for one, and he makes sure he taught me a lesson. <laughs> Yes. Oh, thank you, DJ. Can someone tell us when they did good things and got a blessing? <laughs> Han said now he only has one lamp to. <laughs> That's his blessing. Thing to know not to cut corners. Right. Not, you still, he find ways because when he knows your heart and you fall, he will work with you to remind you. He have the Lord there for a reason. Thank you, DJ. I think I think we can all find ways where was the question that the, how the Lord benefits us. When you've been when you've been obedient to God and receive the blessing. When you've been obedient. Oh, okay. okay. See, I thought that was gonna be an easy question. Right. <laughs> Right, so DJ gave us an example of how she still got a blessing even though she was disobedient. So Kevin's going to give us an example of how he was blessed through obedience. Right, Kevin? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good lead up. Um, you should know me better than that by now. Um, the, I don't know if we can ever know when we are blessed, if we are blessed out of obedience or we are, we are blessed out of grace. Because the moment you think you are being blessed out of obedience, you are sinful. Because you think like you deserve it. You, you think like you have earned it. How, at what point can you think that your blessing is because of your obedience? How would you know that? How would you know that your blessing is not because God is grac gracious, God is grateful? Evie, you have something you want to share? I was just saying, um, pertaining to what Kevin says, I think if you stand up for, you know, for something that you know go against God's will, he will reward you. Exactly. You know, he will reward you. Um, just yesterday, I was just reading, you know, reading Tuesday's lesson. I was thinking, why did God not um, just destroy us when we sin or destroy the world because he can do anything he can just say let there be and there's and there comes another world why he put up with us you know have so much patience have so much mercy so much grace towards us and we are you know we are so we are so sinful you know that that sort of led me to be thinking this week he didn't have to he didn't have to at all he didn't have to but he would have yeah, but he could have destroyed Satan too. Yeah, but he he can. He could have. have but the other he could have, have known that what Satan was telling. This, this is. Been true. Yeah, but this is God. God didn't have to do any of that. He didn't have to put up with any of it. This is God. I'm talking. When I when I was reading the, especially Friday, and he's telling about the star, the billion, the, the whole galaxy. He doesn't have to put up with anything. This is this is God. He stands by himself. He don't need us to be God. You don't need any of us to be God. So I, I look at it and say, I am whatever I go through, I am privileged that God is still merciful and gracious towards me. Whatever comes, um, I say, God, thank you for whatever. And I'm asking you to help me to go through it because I don't deserve it. Every time I said, okay, I'm going to do good, I fail. Even by my thoughts, 
somebody do me something and instead of lending grace or mercy, I think to do something bad to them. So he, he don't have to put up with me. It's his grace and his mercy each day that still lingers towards me. When pain comes, when suffering comes, you know, we, we, I'm, just, I'm just being grateful that he lends me mercy because he don't have to. Exactly. He don't need me to be God. He's God by all by himself. And he, he takes the time to put up with us, to put up with me. Okay, I'm going to give you an example of something that happened with me when I, I think it was in the 80s. It, it may have been the early 90s, but whatever. It was when people still could use pay phones. So uh, me and a couple of my relatives were driving down the street, and a young man ran out in front of the car, and he was running down the street, and there were several men chasing him with sticks. They were coming out of a pool bar. You know what, one of those bars that has the pool tables. And my cousin was like, oh, we got to get out of here because these people might attack us. We're in the wrong neighborhood. And I was like, no, we're not going to leave. We're going to go help this guy. So I stopped the car, and I got out the car, and I ran to the phone booth, and I called the police. And the guy, and I told the guy to get in my car because I don't know why I did this because it was foolish because these were all, people were a lot older than me and stronger than me. But I did, but that guy was so relieved because it was or actually a racial incident. He was a black guy that went to a predominantly white bar and they didn't want him in there and they chased him out. So he was, and I knew he was scared, but the police came and, and they dealt with those people but that guy was almost in tears. He was so thankful. So I'm not saying that we're getting a special blessing because the grace that we receive for salvation is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a blessing from just doing what's right. When you know you help someone, there's a blessing. And I, I could have benefited and kept myself out of harm's way by continuing to drive down the street. But something in me said to stop and help him. And when you do something to help someone because that voice in your head was God telling you to do it, then you feel like, okay, I did what God wanted me to do. And I helped this person in this instance. And I'm not looking for anything extra in return. But you just do things out of kindness because God calls on us to help those who are in need. I like, I like that, um, Teresa, I like that, um, uh, but, uh, I, I think, and I'm, I'm not distract, I'm, I'm just going to make this point irrespective of what you just said, so I'm not commenting on your, your thing. Um, why I think that it's hubris to think that you are blessed when you are obedient and to think you can find an example is, listen to David, listen to David. This idea that when good things happen to you is coming from Christ, I don't think it's necessarily a, a biblical thing, right? Uh, because the blessing that Christ brings is not necessarily here, is not in the here and now. So if you look at David, David says in one of his prayers, he said, when I look and I see how the wicked prosper, prosper. You know what? You know what the wicked says to himself when he's prospering? He's probably saying he's blessed. He's blessed. Look at all these blessings. I'm prospering. I don't think you can use prosperity. I don't think you can use blessing as a sign that you are on the right track. Feelings and things are not how you know if you are doing the right thing. And I, I know that's not the point you're making. I was just trying to say that I think the moment you start to think that you were blessed because of your obedience, it's, in my mind, I think that's unchristlike because you, you're saying, like, I earned this blessing. I was obedient and I got a penny from God because of my obedience. No, I have to I have to say something too because, but the God tells you there's a blessing in obedience over and over throughout the Bible. He also says there's a curse for disobedience because it happens to the Israelites all the time. The blessing can be inspiration and encouragement in your faith. I don't believe that blessings are prosperity and success or material things. I think blessings are 
being touched by the Holy Spirit, being drawn closer to God, to be convicted that you're on the right track and you're doing what God wants you to do. That's what I think a blessing is. But just being successful on this earth and earning material things that are all going to fade away, that won't matter when Christ returns, those things aren't what's important. What's important is the relationship we have with God and the way that we treat others. Because Jesus, as he summed up this commandments in Matthew 22, says, this is the, the, the greatest law, to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So the blessing comes from when we are doing what God tells us to do, when we're extending grace to the other individuals, when we're being kind and showing love to those who are in need. It isn't that we get a personal bonus out of it. It's because we're doing what God wants us to do. We're reflecting, you know, God's love towards others by allowing him to use us to do so. Well, I have Abraham, and there's Job. Abraham did what God asked him to do, and he was blessed. He was rich. <laughs> Let me say it again. He was rich. So much so that we were told that the blessing of Abraham will follow us if we were obedient. And Job was also obedient to God. And ten times over what he had before, he was blessed. So he was blessed spiritually, materially. So was Abraham. So we know that we don't it's not always going to be that way with everyone, but we also know that God blessed people with riches because we've seen it with Abraham. We've seen it with Job. So it, it happens. Not every prosperity, like how people preach the prosperity gospel, is not what God, God don't tell us to come sow seed to receive blessing. That's a different thing altogether. But he said that the nation, if they're obedient, they will be blessed. And blessing comes in different ways. The children of Israel were blessed for wearing the same clothes for 40 years, and they weren't worn out. So blessing comes in different ways. But don't think that when he blesses us, he doesn't also give riches, because, again, Abraham was very rich. Thank you, Tammy. Does anyone else have anything to share? All righty. Is it easier to obey God or to disobey God? That's the final question. I think, I think it's so much easier if we are born in sin and shape in iniquity. Uh, righteousness is something you have to learn and practice, while sin is something that is in our very nature. So is it easier? Absolutely. It's easier to, to disobey than to obey, in my mind. Thank you, Kevin. All right. We don't have as much time left as I thought. I'm just going to read a little bit at, from Hebrews 11, 29, and then from 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. Because a recurring theme in De Deuteronomy is the Lord redeeming his people from slavery in Egypt. And it's mentioned as a reminder in other books of the Bible. So we, I want to look at those two verses and then have a brief discussion before we move forward. So can someone read Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, Hebrews 11, 29 and 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. Is I have First Corinthians ten, one to four. Moreover, brethren, I would not that he should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, all were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Thank you. 
And then I have, I'll read it, Hebrews eleven twenty nine. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. And then the last part I want to read, because it's going to go over the fourth commandment, is from Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. Someone want to read it or should I? Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5, verse 12 through 15. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest, dedication to the Lord your God. And that day no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen and donkeys and other livestock, and any foreigners living among you. All your male and female servant must rest as you do. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hands and powerful arms. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. Okay, so in those verses, why do you think Moses was reminding the Israelites of the Sabbath day and bringing up the fact that he took them out of Egypt? Why was that part important? Because he mentions that he, remember you were brought, you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Why did Moses say that to them? Because it's not mentioned, the observance of the Sabbath isn't mentioned in context to the deliverance from Egypt in, any, in the other verse. I guess one of the reasons is the fact that when they were in Egypt and in bondage, they weren't able to worship God on the Sabbath. They weren't able to rest on the Sabbath day. So one of the main facts of the deliverance from Egypt is that they were they would be able to go back to what God had commanded from creation, the Sabbath day of rest. And then two, he reminds them that it is not of their own strength that they were delivered from Egypt. It was because of God's strong arms. He delivered them. And then three, the foreigners that was with them, the same thing that God expect of them, he expect them to do to those that were now with them because they once were foreigners in a strange land. So you sum it up in the golden rule, do unto others as you have them do unto you. That's what God wanted them to do. Thank you. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Okay, so it's an expression of God's grace towards them, and he's teaching them to show grace to others. And the Sabbath is a symbol of creation and a symbol of grace and redemption. It's a day of rest for everyone, and God is teaching them to extend that same grace to others, even to their livestock and their animals. In Matthew, we find the parable of the unmerciful servant, and everyone is familiar with the unmerciful servant who didn't show the grace that he received, right? and what happened in the end. Um, the lesson is asking us to, if we see parables, parallels between the parable and the, from the unmerciful servant and from the Sabbath commandment in Deuteronomy 5 that we just read. So Tani said yes, and you guys are agreeing. So if God so loved us, we should also love one another, and that's from 1 John 4:11. Thursday's lesson is not for your righteousness. What is just justification before you go by to faith? Thursday? Okay. Just before you go to Thursday, um, I, I know, I know they they share that version of uh, the the Sabbath and uh, with the law, but this is this is another piece that I. That, that, that's not the only version of what you are to do on the Sabbath and what you are not to do on the Sabbath. Right. In Exodus thirty-five, it says. Anyone who works on that day must be put to death. You hardly hear Seventh-day Adventists talk about that anymore. Is that not the, 
fourth commandment? Is this not in the Old Testament? Is this not what the Lord had said? So I, I know the lesson is saying, and I think one of the, 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 one of the big points that I got from it is that you have the grace and law, and almost all the time, grace comes before the law. He says, hey, just like you pointed out with the, why you should worship me on the Sabbath day. You were slaves in Egypt, and I, I saved you. So he's saying, long before you did anything to ingratiate yourself to me, I was there for you. You know, like, so it's like the, the grace. I given you something that you didn't earn nor deserve. And so you should worship. You should be, you should worship. But I, I was just, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that one. With thank, the you, thank you. Grace and law. Okay, so it, can we move on to Thursday? We don't have much time left. Okay, justification by faith. What is that? What is justification by faith? Romans 4, 3 reads, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Right? God is holy and we are, in contrast, unholy. By grace at the cross, we are covered by the blood of Jesus and clothed in righteousness. Deuteronomy 9, 5 through 6, it is not because of our righteousness or in the integrity that you are going in to take possession of the land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand that, I'm sorry, understand then that it's not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess, for you are a stiff-necked people. Did the Israelites do anything to merit God's grace and inherit the promised land? What did they do to merit this grace? Obedience. Obedience? He just called them a stiff-necked people. They weren't very obedient. Oh, I, my tone wasn't right. I meant it with a question and sign at the end. O obedience? Exactly. So Tani is saying, and Naveen were saying that they inherited us because of the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not because they did anything to observe it, because they did not. Um, do you see the principle of justification by faith in the following verses? In as we, okay, Second Timothy first night, I'm sorry, Second Timothy 1, 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before time began. I don't know why I wrote this note in my lesson because I'm, I think I was, had a thought in my head and then didn't write it down. So, okay, I knew where I was going. Okay, so God had a plan for redemption of, for all of his people before time began. Is everyone in agreement on that? Okay, got through that part. So what is our, what's the best way that we can respond to God's grace? We who are imperfect, flawed, and stiff-necked people. Through obedience, we ought to obey God. So I will summarize the lesson. Um, we see God's grace in Deuteronomy. God loves us and God wants a loving relationship with us. God's commands are a moral compass on how to live, giving us guidance in a world of sin. The lesson sums up the heart of the matter in two verses. 1 John 1, 2, 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And the second verse, and this is from the Friday's lesson in, um, from this week, it says, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of mankind. 
and that's from Ecclesiastes 12. Um, we see grace from an omnipotent God, love and mercy through our Savior, and the simplest response required of us is to follow God, to obey him, and to keep his commands. Okay, we'll close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for touching our hearts and our minds with your truth this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to learn and grow in Christ together, to learn from each other, to learn from you, Lord, from your word, and from the movement of the Holy Spirit within us. Continue to be with us throughout this Sabbath day. Guide and direct our hearts towards you, and let us all be a blessing to one another and to those in our community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning, church. And happy Sabbath. Amen. It is a happy, beautiful day today. I um, want to welcome each and every one here in the sanctuary and those online for joining us on this wonderful Sabbath day. We pray that everybody receives a blessing um, as we worship the Lord. Amen. All right. For our announcements, we have um, we had a church board meeting this past Tuesday. The next one will be on the 14th of next month at 7 o'clock on Zoom. We, as a reminder, for Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting uh, on Zoom at 7 o'clock. And um, we'll have a study currently about prayer. And our, for the month of November, we have our birthdays and anniversaries. For our anniversaries, we have uh, Daryl and Sandy Tool. Their anniversary is on the 27th, so remember that. We have a, we didn't do this last week, but we have a couple of belated birthdays. Uh, Ms. Dottie Rulick, happy birthday on the first. Birthday. Amen. Huh? Yeah. Um, our friends Karen and Mark Thompson, uh, they both uh, have the birthday on the third. And um, our dear friend James Long, his birthday was actually last Sabbath on the sixth. <laughs> so happy belated birthday to all of you guys. Um, tomorrow, we have Mr. Leonard, Leonard's birthday. Amen. And the 15th is Ashley Jones. On the 28th is for DJ. And the 30th is Joshua Agnett. So let's remember that, um, remember the birthdays this month. And like I said, um, I have those who have passed, I hope you had a wonderful day on your day. We have another announcement is that um, we have, for those, it's an announcement, I'm just going to reiterate it. Our children's church held during, during 11 o'clock service in the uh, classroom there. Sister Coretta Perkins is not, couldn't be here with us today, but just for announcement, a reminder for these, the people here in church and those online, we do have a children's ministry um, for our young ones. Um, but on that note also, Sister Coretta Perkins is going to be uh, moving her membership on a profession of faith. This is the first reading. She's coming to us from her church in uh, Kentucky. And this is the first announcement for this week. We'll have another one next week on profession of, her, profession of faith to bring her membership here to Hill Country SCA Church in Cedar Park. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay. So though that is our announcements. Now it's time for our invocation by Kevin. Morning. Uh, happy Sabbath. Um, Isaiah 43, 1 to 3. It says, But now, thus said the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Why? For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel. I thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia, and the sea for thee. Let us pray. Lord, I want to give you thanks for keeping us through yet another week. And as we come here to give you praise and worship, and we claim your blessing. And we pray that you will be with those who are not here today, those who are in the hospitals, those who are elsewhere doing your work. 
Be with them also in a special way. And grant us all a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll begin our worship with the first song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Please feel free to sit on our stand and uh, sing along with us. It's uh, prayer time. Do we have any, want to open the floor um, for anyone who has a special request at this time? Teresa? Pierce, your son Pierce, okay. Silent request, okay. Okay, silent, silent. Oh. I'm sorry? Anybody else? Okay. I'm sorry. DJ? Oh. 
Oh, okay. Damon. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's come before the Lord, our maker. Um, feel free to kneel. I'm not able to right now. Uh, if you would like, or stand, or at least bow your heads. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your loving kindness. We come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, but um, asking for your blessing and for your healing and for your loving arms and your mercy and your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for loving us and bringing us through another week. But Lord, there are several uh, special prayer requests. We ask that you will remember Teresa's son, Pierce, and you know his needs and his um, things he's going through. We ask that you will wrap him with your loving arms and guide him every, each day of his life and help him to uh, make decisions and do things that are according to your will and help him to know what your will is for him, Lord. This is my prayer. Um, Lord, we ask that you add a special blessing on uh, Tanny's cousin. Lord, he's having problems with his heart, and you, that's very, very, very serious. And Lord, we just ask for a, a speedy um, heart transfer and be able to have a make a way for a heart, an acceptable heart, to be available for that operation, if it is thy will, Lord. Well, um, we ask for, for your healing and your guidance and your blessing and your love, Lord, in that situation. And bless the family, not just him, Lord, but the family that is affected by this illness, because um, in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, uh, DJ mentioned a friend, Damien, who is uh, in ICU. And I ask that you will let your angels be with him and touch him, l wake him up, give him the blessing of healing and hope, give the blessings to the family and friends of Damien and just um, let your will be done, but heal him as you see fit, Lord. I let your will be done, but we're asking for healing and blessings in that situation as well. And all the silent requests, Lord, we ask you know what they are. Um, you know the hearts of everyone. And let your will be done. We just lift those up. We present those to you. And we ask for your blessing. We ask, Lord, that you will forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. And we help us to be ready to come with you, to go with you whenever you come in your closet, glory, Lord. You know, we know that you're coming as soon, but we... Just pray for endurance to hold on and, and just be, help our faith in you and, your tr and our trust and obedience to you to continue as we wait for your soon coming in this world that we're in. And as we worship you during this time of uh, on this Sabbath in your sanctuary and online, that uh, we ask that your Holy Spirit be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh. And Lord, as we uh, take up the offering, thank you for the gifts, the ability to work and have um, a means of, of income. And we thank you for allowing us to be able to re make a return to you and let those funds be used for your glory and uh, to your reach, your soon coming, and uh, to help your, your uh, knowledge of you be spread throughout the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Okay, we'll have uh, two more songs, and then we'll have a uh, uh, sing along. Or, uh, we'll sing along with a. We'll have a song, and we'll sing along with it with you all. And then we'll have the message. Okay, go ahead. I was just resonating with this song. We can move to the next. I'm sorry about that.
so the next song is uh, uh, another song. Uh, it's, uh, we encourage you to sing along with it. Uh, it will be on the screen. And we will be, uh, well, I guess we'll be singing from here. Uh, for those of us who are familiar with this one, this is a, this is a special. Please sing along with it. Go ahead, DJ, when you're ready. So we'll hand over to the speaker.
believe it. And so this morning, I want to talk to you or talk to us and that very same topic, I know whom I have believed. And if you are familiar, you would have known that that chorus, I know who, I'm, who I've believed in, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which have committed is taken from 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. The story is told of a man who was once asked, what he believed about God, and he responded, I believe what my church believes. And then he was asked, what does your church believe? And he said, my church believe what I believe. And then he was asked, what do you and your church believe? And his response was, we both believe the same thing. This morning, I ask you that are here with me and those online, what do you believe? I know in whom I believe. Let us pray. Eternal God and our Heavenly Father, once more we come before your presence, God, acknowledging that you are the creator of heaven and earth. Father, we come before you feeble, empty, broken lumps of clay. Lord, we need to hear a word from you. The songwriter says, we need to hear from you, and if we don't hear from you, we will not know what to do. And so your people come this morning, Lord, needing to hear from you. Lord, as I come and stand between you and your people, I pray that I will not be seen. God, I'm only availing myself to be used as a vessel for your glory. So Lord, I ask this moment that you accept me don't refuse me. But I pray, Father, that I will be insignificant, but your word will be significant, that it will go forth with power, clarity, and authority. I pray that hearts will change. I pray that someone will catch a glimpse of glory today and heaven will come down and fill their soul. And so into your hands I commit myself and into your hands I commit the waiting congregation. And so Father, I pray that we will hear from you today in Jesus' name, amen. And so, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Timothy, 2, uh, 2 Timothy 1, sorry, as we read verse 12 and 13. I will read in your hearing. It says that, well, it says, for the wish cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Verse 13, hold fast the firm, sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. My friends, I want to tell you that Paul wrote this letter to young Timothy. And if you can guess where was Paul when he was writing this letter, knowing full well that Paul had gone through several experiences and now young Timothy was coming up and he was telling young Timothy to hold fast to the firm words, the sound doctrine that he have heard. 
But he told Timothy that he was not ashamed of the gospel, for he know in whom he believed. I want to tell you that Paul was sitting comfortable in a Roman jail. And can you imagine somebody sitting in a jail cell knowing full well that probably the next minute his life would have come to an end? Because theologians have suggested that this was actually Paul's last letter. But he was writing to Timothy, as he's writing to you and I today, to tell us to hold firm in our faith because we should know in whom we believe. And so he said to Timothy, do not be afraid because in verse 7 he says, God has not given you or me a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And so he said to Timothy, find the flames of spiritual gift that God has given you and be faithful to what you have been called to do. Paul is saying, I have labored for Christ. I have been beaten. I have been shipwrecked. I have been chased from city to city. If you, if you want to understand the suffering that Paul went through, you can start by reading the book of Acts. No time after he met God on the road to Damascus and was converted and he started his missionary journey, we are told in different chapters in the book of Acts, oh, he had to run for his life from city to city. So much so the scripture tells us that several of the cities he went to, he had to shake the dust off his feet because the very people who he went to preach the message had rejected him. But while he was sitting in a jail cell, he's telling Timothy, I would have it no other way. I would have it no other way from doing what my God has called me to do. And so he was telling Timothy that he was not ashamed of the gospel. And he said to Timothy, you do not need to be ashamed of the gospel. Neither do you need to be ashamed of me, even for the mere fact that I am here sitting in a jail cell. And so, my friends... He did not only tell Timothy that Timothy need not be ashamed. He told Timothy that he is confident that God is able to keep what he had entrusted, what he had committed to him until that day. And so he went to, on to explain to Timothy that because of his faith in God, because of who God is to him, a jail cell does not matter to him. My friends, some of us sitting here today or some of us watching online probably saying, I don't think I could have taken it as easy as Paul. I don't think I would have continued in the ministry with, with all those beating and suffering that Paul went through. But you know what kept Paul? It is his confidence. It is his relationship with God. It is the knowledge that he know who Christ is. My friends, in order to endure, we have to know who Christ is. And so, even though Timothy was young, he was telling Timothy, now you are a leader of the church. You are facing these challenges. And let me tell you some of these challenges. Because he told Timothy in, sec in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that in the last days, the people are going to come with strange doctrine. You are going to be faced with opposition, but you have to remain resolute. And so he's telling Timothy that the challenges are coming, but you have to face them and don't get weary. And so, my friend, do you, I ask the question this morning, know in whom you have believed in? Paul said to Timothy, I do not only believe in God, but I am persuaded, I am confident that God is able to keep to guard that which I have committed unto him. Do you know what Paul committed unto God? My friends, it was his life. 
He committed his life unto God. And he said to Timothy, though they beat me, though they abuse me, though they curse me, because I know that I have committed my life to him, I have nothing to fear. Have you committed your life today? Do you know in whom you have believed? So Paul is saying, I have a relationship with God. My faith has been strengthened. And so I am confident that the, the work that God called me to do in preaching the gospel, I will do it comes what may. You see what Paul did he banked his life in God's safety deposit box. You know, when you go to the bank and they take to get to that safety deposit box and you have to go through all these, you know, um, cells and all these things to get to that secured location. I don't know if any of you have ever visited the Federal Reserve, but I have. And to get downstairs where they have the goal, you have to go through security upon security and this pass and that pass just to get where they have the goals. And you can't get inside, but if your finger is small enough, you can, you know, put it through that little hole and probably touch the goal. So Paul was banking in that treasury, in that safety deposit box that God have. And he's saying, when I put my life in his hand, no one or nothing can take it away. And that's the confidence we need to have. My friends, we are living in some perilous time, and we know we are living in the last days, and trials are going to come upon us who are children of God. Some of us are going to face persecution, but like Paul, if we know in whom we believe, we can face the persecution knowing that God is able to keep that which we have committed unto him. And so, like the forefathers of all, if you read the story of Husk and Jerome and all of those people, many were burned at the stake, but while they were being burned, they were singing, they were singing praises unto God. Why? Because they know in whom they believe. They know that if men kill the body, they cannot kill the soul. And even though Paul knew that his time was coming to an end, he knew that God is able to keep him until that day. My friends, in order for us to have that same confidence in God, that firm belief that Paul have, we have to commit ourselves to God. We have to have that assurance that God is able. But how do we have that? We have to start by reading and obeying and studying the word of God. We have to find that time to connect with God. You know, we are told in studies that after Paul met God on the Damas Damascus Road, he spent few years in studying, learning about God, connecting with God before he went out on this missionary journey. I know we probably don't have the time to come away to spend two years or three years, but my friends, we need to take the example of Christ. We need to have a connection with God. It is only then that we will remain faithful under persecution because if, if we do not connect with him, when the trials come, it's going to be easy for us to slip and fall. But if we are connected with him, he said that he's Bonner over us his love, and he will keep us under his wing, and we shall, and nothing shall come nigh thy dwelling. That Psalms 91. But my friends, we can't live with only the assurance of others. We need that experience ourselves. And so Paul tell Timothy, I know the faith that your mother had and your grandmother, because Timothy 
was brought up in faith by his mother and his grandmother. But Paul was saying, when I met you, I've not only seen the faith of your mother, Loy, and your grandmother, Eunice, but I also saw the faith that you personally have in Christ Jesus. And so you, my friends, have to have that faith for yourself. You see, we cannot take the words of our parents or our pastors and leaders and teachers. We need the experience for ourselves. It is the experience that we have, the personal testimony and the reminders that will take us through the hard times. So do you, do you believe wholeheartedly that God is able to do for you what he said he will do when the difficult times come? Are you, my friend, able and willing to confidently say like Paul, I know in whom I believe. One of the reasons we need to know in whom we believe is that when the difficult times come, we can say without a shadow of a doubt, I have an anchor that keeps the soul. Steadfast and firm while the billows roll. But how can you say you have an anchor that keeps the soul if you are not connected to that anchor? You see, Paul remembered the words of John chapter 3, verse 16, that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so with those words, with that faith, with that confidence, Paul was able to say, I am not ashamed even though I am in the jail cell. Paul was able to say, I am persuaded that he will keep me because he sent his son to die for me. And because he sent his son to die for me, he will keep me until that day. My friend, I want to talk to us about that day. You see, Paul was not just living for the here and now. He was telling Timothy that while I'm here, while I'm doing the work of God, while I'm facing persecution, it is all right because a better day is coming. A day that God will keep me my friends, and so you two are here today, we are here today, and we are encouraged not just to live for the year and now. We are encouraged to live with the hope Paul says at the end of it all, we should be able to say, I have run the race, I have kept the faith, and therefore laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And that is what Paul was saying. He had run the race, and he had kept the faith as difficult as it is, and he knew that God in whom he believed is able to keep him. My friends, are you living for the year and now? Or are you living for that day? Have you committed everything to God? You see, when Paul says that he knew that God is able to keep what he entrusted, let me tell you, Paul entrusted his ministry, Paul entrusted his life, and Paul entrusted his faith in the hand of God because he knew that he cannot keep himself. He knew that anything he has is of no value unless God is in it. So we have to understand that we cannot keep ourselves. We have to understand that nothing we have is of value unless we turn it over to Jesus. My friends, Timothy. Timothy is told that you need to fan the flame of righteousness. Are we fanning the flame of righteousness today? Are we keeping that spiritual fire burning within us like when we first believe? Or are you ashamed of the gospel? Because you see, my Bible tells me that we should not be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. You see, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that kept you and I. It is the power of the cross and it is the love of God that keep you and I here today. In Sabbath school, we talk about law and grace. And we recognize that the reason why we are here is not because we are good. 
It's not because we deserve it, but it is the power of Christ that worketh salvation unto all men. And so he's saying to Timothy that we should live as Christian wholesome life. We should put away immorality from among us and we should, be, we should choose to be good. We should live a holy life. Not because we deserve anything, but because of God's grace and because of God's love. He told Timothy that God showed us his love through Jesus Christ. And he made it plain to all men. And he brought the power of sin curse on us when he gave Christ to die for us. This was the premise that Paul's faith and belief was built upon. That God is God all by himself. That God is able to keep us. And that God sent Jesus to die for us because he loves us. And Paul is saying, because I know in whom I believe. Because I have experienced him. Because I have talked with him. Because I have walked with him. I am now telling you, Timothy... As I am here today telling you, my friends, that because of those experiences, we can say boldly that comes what may, we are confident that God will keep us. And then he told Timothy in verse 13, hold on to what I've taught you. Hold on to the pattern of the sound words that is shaped in your faith and the love you have for Christ Jesus. Why, Timothy? Why should you hold on to those? Why, church? Why should you hold on to those? Because evil times are coming. And Daddy mentioned it in Sabbath school this morning when she says, some of the people do not want organized religion because they want religion that fits with their pattern. They want to interpret the Bible the way they want it. And so if it doesn't fit their criteria, they say, ah, I have nothing to do with that. But Paul tells Timothy, hold on, my brother, to the firm word. He says, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their ears are itching to hear. Whatever they want to hear and they will reject the truth and chase after myths. I can tell you that you think Paul wrote that only for Timothy? It is here today. As strange as it might sound, it is here today. Because many people will tell you, I'm a Christian, but I'm not spiritual. I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in certain things. Why? Because the Bible is not good enough for them because it does not line up with what they want to hear. And so, even though Paul wrote to a young Timothy and he urges Timothy to rebuke the people who are teaching false doctrine and he should encourage the people in good teaching, we have a work to do, church. They're all around us. I can assure us that many of us have come in contact with people who tell us, oh, I don't need to believe in the Bible because man wrote it. You know what? Man wrote the textbook you study in school and you swear your life by it to get a job. But the undiluted word of God, 2 Peter tells us that holy men of God move to give us the word of God. And so even though Timothy had those those challenges in his young life, you and I have those same challenges today. We have friends and we have family members who do not want to live according to thus say the Lord. And so if somebody comes along and tell them the prosperity gospel, sow your seed of faith and you will be rich. Bring your money to me and I can give you this and that. 
They will sell their life if needs be to get this. But when God said to them, if you love me, keep my commandment, they think it's very hard to do. And so my friends, I want to tell you today that God has not given us the spirit of fear. He has given us a spirit of power and of a sound mind. And if your faith has been tested, and if you have been persecuted for righteousness sake, it is only for a time, but it is not for eternity. We have the examples of Stephen. We have Paul. Even John who gave us the book of Revelation was put in a pot of oil. And though they faced those trials, my friend, they believed that God was able. The scripture tells us in Hebrews that Abraham believed and it was counted unto him for righteousness. I ask the question, do you know in whom you believe? Do you believe that God is able to keep you? Do you believe that God is all powerful and that God is almighty? Do you believe that God has gone to prepare a place for you? He tells us before he went, he said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer because I, and I can tell you, my friend, those were the words that Paul banked his faith on because God told him that he, the almighty, the powerful God, have overcome the world. And so that is why Paul says, I have committed everything to him and I know that he's able because you know one of Paul's message was preaching the resurrection and he was chased out of cities because those Jews didn't believe in the resurrection but you see Paul believed in the resurrection and that is why Paul says God can keep what I've committed to him until that day because Paul know that even when he die God is gonna raise him up on that day My friends, my encouragement to us today is to be faithful, is to fan the flame of the gospel and do not be ashamed of it. Paul tell young Timothy, never be ashamed to tell others of our God. Never, no matter the circumstances, let the world know that you serve a risen Savior that is in the world today, my friends. Let the world know that God is able to do what he say he will do because that's the God we serve. You know, Jude tell us in Jude chapter 24 that God can keep us and he will present us faultless before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy. That's the God we serve. He's not dead. Because John in Revelation tells us, he says, Behold, I am alive forevermore. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. And I have the key to death and the grave. My friends, the God that you serve is able. The songwriter says he's able, he's able. I know he's able. I know my God is able to see me through. And then it goes on to say, oh, my loving brother, when this world on fire, don't you want God's bosom to be a pillow? Hide me under the rock of ages. Paul was in a prison cell. The world was on fire for him, but he knew he had shelter in the bosom of God. How are you able to tell somebody to remain faithful? How will you be able to tell somebody that even though you are in chains, you are not ashamed? How will you be able to tell somebody you know in whom you believe if you have not experienced that? 
You see, if Paul didn't have that personal experience, he would not be able to tell Timothy those words. He probably would say to Timothy, lean on your faith the best way you can, but I don't have anything else to tell you. But that was not the case. He was able to tell Timothy that he was persuaded. Why? Because he have experienced it. God is calling you and I today, my friends, to experience him. He's calling you and I to have a closer relationship with him. He's calling you and I to come into that one-on-one -on -one place whereby we can cry, Abba, Father. You see, the scripture tells us that because Jesus Christ died to save us, we are no longer slaves, but we are now sons and daughters of God. And that is what Paul banked on. Paul knew, as Deuteronomy 4 verse 6 tells us, that man cannot live by bread alone, but you can trust every word of the living God, my friend. Paul was able to put his confidence in God. Paul was able to tell Timothy, my young son. You know what I love? Paul says Timothy was his young son. And as a father, he was telling Timothy, my son, be faithful. My son, continue to build your faith. You know who else encourages their son? If you ever read the book of Proverbs, Proverbs began with the wise man Solomon saying, my son, listen to my counsel. Listen to my counsel. Today I ask God to let his people hear from him. And I am going to tell you today that he's saying, I am speaking. All you have to do Listen to my counsel. Micah. Micah was going, the, Israel was going through a miserable time. And Micah saw the affliction of the people. And Micah said, I will be patient as the Lord punishes me, for I have sinned against him. But after that, he will take up my case and give me justice for all I have suffered. The Lord will bring me into light and I will see his righteousness. Then my enemy will see that the Lord is on my side. I think Paul was quoting Michael when Paul saying, even though I was in prison, I was not ashamed. Because Paul knew that at the end of it all, until that day that he had committed his life to God, until that day, the enemy will see that God was on his side. My friends, I'm not here to tell you that it's going to be easy. And I'm not here to tell you that it is always easy. But I'm here to tell you that if you remain faithful, God will be on your side. If you remain faithful and commit to God your life, your business, your children, your spouse, everything you have, like Paul, commit it unto God and he will keep it until that day. As I come to a close, like the person who wrote the song, I know whom I believe, it says, they do not know why God wondrous grace to me had made known. Now why unworthy Christ in love redeem me for his own soul. So they're saying they don't know those stuff. They don't know how God's saving grace had kept them or why he imparted to them his love. They don't know how the spirit work convincing men of sin. So you know, all true, they said, I know not. But then they say, but I know in whom I believe. And I am persuaded that he's able. So when they knew nothing else, 
They knew not how the spirit work. They, they understand not the love of God. They don't know why God extend mercy and grace unto them. But they know in whom they believe. Today, my friends, I say to you, you might not know why you go through what, what you go through. You do not know why the storm cloud is always over your head. But I can say without a shadow of a doubt, if you know in whom you believe, that God is able to save you. And so, I, I end by telling you, keep trusting. God can keep you. Keep believing. God can keep you. He can keep you. And he will keep you. Commit yourself to him. Know for certainty in whom you believe and remain resolute to your belief. That is what Paul did while he was sitting in a Roman cell waiting to die. He was resolute in his belief. And he was able to share that with young Timothy. And he's sharing that with us today. That we should remain faithful if we know in whom we believe. Because if we believe in the God that Paul believed in, he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. If you remain faithful, my friend, whether you are alive when he come or you are sleeping, if you remain faithful, the voice you will hear would be the voice of God saying, come home, my children. And that will be a fulfillment of what Paul said. He was able to keep that which I've committed to him until that day. I Ask the question, do you know in whom you believe? Amen. Isn't it wonderful to know that you don't have to be able to explain the wonder-working power, the resurrecting power of the one in whom you believe to believe in him? Well, let's close with the hymn, uh, To God Be the Glory. Uh, please feel free to stand or sit, but whatever you do, just sing along with us this closing hymn.
Amen. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for speaking to us today. Lord, I pray that now that you speak, we will do our part and listen. Not only listen, but we will act upon what you call us to do. Father, as we are about to leave this place to go to our various homes, I ask that you dismiss us with your choicest blessings, O oh God. And may you watch between us while we separate one from another. And as the Sabbath day continue, may we rest, abide, and worship you in the beauty of holiness. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 